I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight to Eastside Baptist Church for our Sunday evening worship service. Uh, let's continue to pray for these shoe boxes and where God providentially is going to have these boxes go and how the Spirit of God is going to use this ministry here to minister to families and to reach lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's remember that and be in much prayer for that ministry. And what a wonderful thing it is that we're able to uh, have 250 boxes that are going to go out and, and, that, the, and that will be used um, to spread the gospel. Also remember that December the 4th is the Christmas parade here in Liberty. And um, Eastside Baptist Church is going to be uh, part of that parade. And so we're in need of candy and we're in need of volunteers. If you want to volunteer, you can sign up. If uh, you'd like to bring candy, just please let Cooper or Jessica know. And um, I'm, I know they could use it. Tonight, I want to do something a little bit different as we open up. And I'm going to ask uh, Cecil if he'd go ahead and make his way down here and sit in this chair here. Um, and as Cecil's making his way down here, I um, received a message that uh, Cecil's numbers were uh, high, and um, if his numbers don't come down, he's going to have to have surgery and then go on dialysis. Uh, he will go back tomorrow, and, uh, and so I want to call upon the church tonight that we would gather around this brother, rally around him, that we would practice the biblical pastime of the church coming, laying hands on a brother, and lifting our voices up to the Lord, our prayers up to God, and praying for God's will uh, in Brother Cecil's life. I just want to read to you tonight from James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick person. And the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven we're taught in James that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so tonight, I want to ask if the church would just come forward, if you're able, would you gather around this brother, and can we lay hands on him tonight and pray over him, pray for God's will, pray for the Lord to move, and, and as he goes tomorrow, um, that God's will would prevail. And after we've been praying over him for some time, then I will close us in a word of prayer. Let's gather around him here. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you tonight. We lift up our brother in Christ, Brother Cecil, to you. Lord, we are so thankful for him, love him as a brother. And God, 
we lift him to you and we ask together that you would touch his body. We ask that you would bring those numbers down. We ask God that your will would be done in his life. And God, we just pray and we just ask for you to move physically in Brother Cecil. For it's in Jesus' name we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. with me this evening. We're going to use our blue hymn book and uh, we're going to sing page 497, I Will Praise Him. We're going to sing the first, third, and fourth verses. sung that song. Was that new to anybody? Yeah, well, good. Well, it's always good to go back and sing those old hymns. We're going to go to page 738. Maybe this one will be a little bit more familiar to everybody. This is the wonder of it all. It's been a long time since I've done this one as well. There's a wonder of sunset at Thank you. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message that we heard earlier today. Father, we ask that you touch Cecil and heal him in Jesus' name, Father. We just, as we come this time in the service this evening, Father, we just ask that you bless the gift and the giver, and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. to encourage you to take your Bibles tonight and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Tonight we are looking at chapter 9 and verse 33 through verse 37. Who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? I recently heard a story about two men that died and went to heaven. One was a preacher, and the other was a bus driver. They both lived remarkable lives, and so as the bus driver, or I'm sorry, as the preacher dies, he is issued into the presence of the Lord. And As he goes into his heavenly reward, he is met by St. Peter. And St. Peter is taking him around, and he then shows him where his house is going to be, his dwelling place is going to be. And he goes to this humble place, and he looks at this, and he says to himself, Well, if this is my place, if this humble abode here is my place, that bus driver must have just a small little shack. And he insists on seeing the bus driver's heavenly reward. He insists on seeing the bus driver's place of residency now because he just knows it has to be smaller And Peter says, if you want to. So he takes him and shows him the bus driver's place. And the preacher is amazed because the bus driver's place is four times the size of the preacher's house. He says, how how can this be, Peter? I preach the word for you. I ministered, I pastored the church. How in the world could I have a smaller place than the bus driver? And Peter said, well, it's like this. When you preached, they all went to sleep. But when the bus driver drove, they all prayed. (laughs) Who is the greatest? That story, while it's funny, it brings to mind... The conversation about who the greatest is. And sometimes we can have it in our minds, the same debate that the disciples enter into. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? What is my reward going to look like? What is your reward going to look like? Who is going to be at the right and the left of Jesus? Who is going to be the greatest? And we can begin to think about what I've done for the kingdom of God, what I've given for the kingdom of God, what I've achieved for the kingdom of God, surely I'm going to have this great reward. Surely it's going to be about my 
achievements and my legacy. And the disciples learn a really hard lesson as we get into this story. So if you'll join me in Mark chapter 9, and we're going to look at verse 33 through verse 37. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. Because on the way, they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve. And said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. He took a child, had him stand among them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. Let us pray tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it is such a privilege that we can come together, that we can have fellowship together, that we can join together to worship you. So thankful for the music and the singing we had earlier. And now, Lord, as we open your word, and we look at what your word has to tell us and what your word has to instruct us on, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to perceive, that we would understand the clear-cut teaching of your word and that we would obey your word that your spirit would evaluate our lives and help us to be more like Jesus. For it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. As we look at the passage tonight and as we examine what is here in the text, we find the disciples arguing, questioning, over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. We find the struggle within the twelve. Who was the closest to Jesus? Who was the most special to Jesus? Who did Jesus love the most? Who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God? We find that Jesus has been giving them illustrations and stories of humility about he will suffer, about he will die, about he's going to be rejected. And yet, as all this is going on, all the disciples can think about is what about me? What about me? What about me? All the disciples can think about is Where's my place? What's my place? What's my role going to be? All they can think about is, who is it that is going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And we see Jesus answer this problem in the most interesting of ways as he teaches them privately. And I just want to bring to your attention that This is one of the major themes in the Gospel of Mark. Private instruction with his group, called a small group, where he often takes the twelve in a home or in some kind of private place, and he really teaches them the truth. He really shows them the things that the crowds don't get to see that the others aren't privy to. And here we're going to see the same thing. When we look at this story, it breaks down this way. 
you have a setting in the first part of verse 33 that sets up the story that is being told by the narrator, Mark. In the second part of verse 33 through verse 34, you have a problem that the story addresses. The problem is, who is the greatest? Who is the most gifted? Who is the one that uh, Jesus is going to crown as the greatest in the kingdom? And then in verse 35 through verse 37, you have a resolution to the story. You have Jesus who clearly teaches the answer to the problem that they are arguing and questioning and debating and facing. You see all of those things as the, as the story that Mark tells unravels. So think with me first how Mark sets this whole story, this whole narrative up. Think about what has just happened. You have had the transfiguration, the glory of God seen in Jesus Christ on top of that large mountain. Think about that mountain. Think about them being on top of that mountain. I can't imagine even uh, attempting to climb a mountain like that. We went to Grandfather Mountain years ago, and I didn't even make it to the swinging bridge. I got to the top, and I froze, paralyzed with fear and couldn't move. I can't imagine being on top of this mountain. Yet they were on top of this mountain, and they saw the glory of God in Jesus Christ. As they come down from this mountain. Remember, it is just three of the disciples and it is Jesus. So what does Jesus find? He finds the disciples in a dispute with the religious leaders. And there is a demon possessed that needs to have that demon exercised out and the dispute is the disciples had apparently tried this. They had tried to do what they saw Jesus do. They had tried to tap into that spiritual power. They had tried to do what they knew they had seen before in Christ. Only they realized it's not working. It's not happening. I'm not getting the results I want to get. Have you ever been there, church? Have you ever thought, I'm not getting the results that we should get? I'm not seeing the results that I expect to see. And as they asked Jesus, again in a private setting, Jesus, why couldn't we cast out the demon? He tells them, this can only happen by prayer. You know, it's always amazed me when I read that Jesus' response about prayer. And I think about the most necessary thing in spiritual life amongst believers is that we be a people that are sold out to prayer. That we understand the power of prayer. That we understand that things don't happen apart from prayer. Yet, I think about one of the most neglected areas of spiritual life today is that of prayer. We simply don't pray the way we should. We simply don't invest in prayer like the church used to invest in prayer, living by prayer. Reminded of that great preacher in London, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and he was an eloquent preacher. He was a magnificent preacher. He could preach circles around anybody preaching today, yet he was so humble in his response. It's not the eloquence of man. It's not that I can preach so well. 
It's that I have a whole church preaching down there in the basement, or praying down there in the basement, praying that God would move. And when he preached, people moved, not because he preached, because people were praying. We need to get back to the power of prayer and believing that when we come together as a church, and pray we are praying to a God of can not to a God of can't we are limited in what we can do but God is not limited in what he can do And when we really own that and really believe that and really come before God as a praying church believing church that God can do that we won't run into the dilemma of the disciples where the demon can't be casted out We'll run into God's abundance being poured out upon the church. Question of the hour is, do we believe? Question of the hour is, do we believe that all things are possible through prayer, through trusting God with our circumstances? That doesn't go just as a church. That goes individually as well in your lives. In my life, do we believe that God can Do we believe the famous words of, but God? Do we believe that? Or is that just a nice bumper sticker, a nice cliche, a nice Christian t-shirt? How deep does it really go for us? Following the inability of the disciples, we find a second prediction of the death of Christ. Jesus is rallying the disciples together and he's saying, look, it's going to happen. The Son of Man is going to die. He is going to suffer greatly. And after he dies, he will then be raised from the dead. Another amazing truth. I feel like Today, in our generation, the resurrection is kind of slided back to one day of the year. Easter, we really talk about the resurrection, sing about the resurrection, we preach about the resurrection, we're focused on the resurrection. In the New Testament, it was everyday life focused on the resurrection. The resurrection was the central message that was preached, proclaimed, and believed upon. It wasn't slide it back to an Easter Sunday. It was every day they were sharing and talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They lived and died by the resurrection. Following this, we come to this story. As Jesus and the disciples are traveling. Jesus and the disciples are making their way to their home base in Capernaum. And as they are traveling, apparently there is a private conversation that the disciples are having. They're having this conversation about who is the greatest. Now, Many believe that the context of this conversation is after the prediction of Jesus is brought to be. That Jesus is king, that Jesus is Messiah, that Jesus has, um, has been killed, he's been resurrected, and he is reigning. So as Jesus is reigning, the 12 disciples want to know, Who is Jesus going to pick to be the greatest? Who's going to go down as being the greatest in the kingdom? Now, in Mark chapter 10, you may be interested to know there's going to be a similar conversation of who will be able to sit at the right and the left of Jesus. Who will be able to sit in those prominent positions with Jesus? And this is something of the same conversation. Who's going to be the greatest? Perhaps they were talking about who is the most eloquent out of the bunch? Who has the most giftedness on them? Who is the workhorse in the group? Who is the most spiritual in the group? Who is it that Jesus is going to handpick 
And who is going to go down as the greatest in the kingdom? This conversation is going on as they're making their way to Capernaum. Now in the text it says they are arguing. And you just need to know that uh, that can be taken a couple of different ways. It can be taken as discussing. It can be taken as having a debate. It can be taken as a full-fledged argument. From what we know of the passage, from the context that we're looking at tonight, it was a debate. Uh, They were arguing, they were debating about who was going to hold this prominent role. Now, in our culture today, we read this passage and we think, how inappropriate of a conversation. How egotistical of a conversation. Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to mean the most to God? Who's going to reign with Jesus as the right-hand man of Jesus? That sounds very competitive. That sounds very ego-driven. That sounds egotistical. That sounds like an inappropriate thing to even get involved in in the first place. But you must understand in the first century, this was a very common thing to be talking about as your social status depended on upon your performance who's going to be the greatest who would jesus pick who's going to propel to the place of prominence of being jesus's right hand man his number two now as this conversation is going on We know that while this might have been normal for the culture that they are living in for that first century, we also know there's some shame involved. We also know there's some conviction involved. Because later we're going to see when Jesus does ask the question, what were y'all discussing? What were y'all arguing about? What were y'all debating? Utter silence. Complete silence silence they don't speak up and they don't say well Jesus we're talking about who's going to be the greatest they don't answer and say we're talking about who's going to be your right hand man who's going to sit at your right who's going to sit at your left they don't say anything you know it's amazing to me that as Jesus asks this question to them they actually think It's a way out to be silent. If we sit in silence over our shame, the question will go away. I'll tell you what I've learned. I've learned when somebody asks you a direct question about something specifically, they know about that specific thing. I'll never forget a teacher sending a note home with me in sixth grade and it wasn't in my favor it wasn't to compliment me to my mother it wasn't one of those really neat notes that you get that says we really enjoy having Joshua in class he sure is an inspiration to all the learners here he sure does encourage them as I'm teaching but it was of the opposite and so when I get home My mother says, did anything interesting happen to you at school today? It gets worse. Do you have a note or something like that that you would like to share with me? Um, No, not really. I don't think I want to share any note or any kind of words or any kind of thing. Are you sure that you don't have something for me? a note, a word, something you might want to share with me. I'm sure I don't want to share anything with you. Now, we still debate about this today. 
I don't see that as a lie because I really didn't want to share that with my mother. I knew that in sharing that, I was going to get a whooping. And I didn't want that. And she didn't directly ask, do you have it? She said, do you want to share it? No, I don't want to share that with you. I know what the consequence is going to be. As they're having this discussion, and later as they sit down, and Jesus asks, what are you arguing about? What are you questioning about? What are you debating about? Isn't it pretty obvious Jesus already knows? Isn't it pretty obvious Jesus knows what they're arguing, debating, or discussing? Yet there are crickets. There is a quietness there because there is a shame, that there is shame to even be having this conversation that they're having. Now, there's two options. How did Jesus know what they were discussing? Well, number one, he overheard them, possibly. But number two, um, he's the Son of God. <laughs> he knows what's on their minds. He can read their minds, and he knows what they're thinking. Oftentimes in the Gospels, we find Jesus answering the question they didn't even ask, the next question they were about to have. And so, but again, they throw all of that aside, <laughs> And they're having this in-depth discussion in their own arrogance about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. I often thought when reading this that uh, did they really think it was a no-brainer that, that one of the 12 was going to be greater than the saints that had even already gone on? But yet they were convinced one of the 12 was going to be the greatest in the kingdom, I wonder who that is going to be. And can you just imagine the debate that's going around the table? So, as they are asked the question, and as they are quiet and don't answer the question, Jesus moves on to answering the dilemma they were facing in the most interesting of ways as he just teaches them. Now, as parents here tonight, you would probably say maybe that you didn't always discipline your children the exact same way every time something happened. Maybe you spanked them, but maybe, depending on the situation, there was a different method you use to address the situation at hand. And here Jesus doesn't directly call them out. He doesn't directly smack their hand. He doesn't directly have any kind of confrontation with them. Instead, what does he do? He tells them, gather around. He gathers the 12 disciples around the table. Remember, a great theme in Mark is this private instruction that others weren't privy to. It's this private instruction that Jesus is going to spend time giving to the disciples that he's not going to give to a large crowd and surely not going to give to religious leaders. And so Jesus is going to handle the problem. He's going to address their dilemma, but he's going to do it in the format of teaching them an important lesson. I tell you, church, I think we need more of this. I think we need more of, instead of outright rebuke at times, to gather people around, have a discussion, teach the biblical principle, rather than just land blasting a person. Because Jesus solves the dilemma. Look with me. At verse 35 through verse 37 in your text. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. Look at the way he, he takes the problem... He takes the issue, he takes what they're debating about, he takes the argument, and he hits that argument, he addresses that argument head on. 
He doesn't have to say, you, you guys are being ridiculous. He doesn't have to say, you're believing your own hype. He doesn't have to say, your argument shows your conceit. Instead, he hits them at the crux of the matter. Look at it, look at it again in verse 35. If anyone wants to be first, wants to be greatest, in other words, he must be last. He must be servant of all. He wants to show them that number one, throughout the scriptures, the principle is laid out that God gives grace to the humble. That what really gets God's attention is humility, is self-denial, is humbling oneself before God in worship. I mean, think about what prayer is. Prayer is us humbling ourselves before the throne of God, marking utter dependency that we are depending on God to solve a problem in our life. And we're saying, God, I can't do it. God, it's out of my expertise. God, I can't handle this, but I know you can. And we are lifting that up to God and we are asking for God's help and we are recognizing him as Lord over our lives. That's what prayer is. It marks utter dependency. On the other hand, God is very clear in his word. He resists the proud. He resists the prideful. He resists those who are prideful, but he gives grace to the humble. Side note for a second. What was it exactly that caused the downfall of Satan? You can read about it in Ezekiel 28. You can read about it in uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. You can read about it in Isaiah. How do you have the most beautiful angel ever created. How do you have this figure and one day something goes terribly wrong and he's thrown from heaven and takes one third of the angels, one third of the stars with him. You know what we are told? We are told that Satan's downfall was pride. It was pride. He said, I think I'll be God. And God looked at him and said, probably not in my lifetime. Kicked him out of heaven. Expelled him from his presence in the heavenly realms. God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. Who did Jesus have the most trouble with? It wasn't the prostitutes. It wasn't the tax collectors. It wasn't the sinner. It wasn't the rebel. It was the religious leaders. It was the religiously proud and prideful that he had such a problem with. Again, God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the prideful, he opposes the proud. And so here in this statement that Jesus makes about if you want to be first, if you want to be great, you have to first be last and servant to all. The great one, the greatest one, Jesus made it known of his own ministry. I have not come from heaven to earth to be served by man as some kind of king. I didn't come so I could sit back in the easy chair and so I could have everybody come and serve me as the traditional king was served. 
But instead, this king, this Lord said, I have come to serve, not be served. So if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, if you want to sit at the right or the left, If you want to be in that conversation, then Jesus is saying what you have to do first is you have to go from this desire to be first and this desire to be center stage and this desire to be seen and this desire to be known and you have to be last. This would have been shocking for that culture to hear. This would have been shocking for anybody to hear Jesus say, last? No, no, I want to be first. Last, take a back seat. Be a servant. No, I want to be first. And I want all the accolades. Yet Jesus, as his own ministry, made it all about servanthood. And the Gospel of John Jesus washes the disciples' feet. You would be hard-pressed to find a more grimy, low, disgusting job in biblical times as that of a foot washer. Yet Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Not to give another ordinance in the church, but to give a model of how we are to do ministry. That we are to wash one another's feet. We are to put others above ourselves. We are to deny ourselves, and we are to serve. We are to be servants of the Most High, and we are to serve people. And so he makes that first very shocking statement in verse 35. And then then look at what he does in verse 36. He took a child, had him stand among them, and talking, I'm sorry, and talking him in his arms, or taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. Now we don't know in Capernaum, the home base there of Jesus and the disciples, we don't know whose house they're at. Most scholars will say that they were more than likely at Peter's house. They believe it was Peter's house that they were at. The same scholars would say that when Jesus takes a child here for this illustration, that uh, that it was Peter's house, it was Peter's family, there was Peter's children there. And that he just grabbed one of those children and that he just took the child as a physical, visual illustration of, For how the kingdom is to function, how the kingdom is to operate, and he is using this child as an illustration. So go back to verse 36 again. He he takes a child, had him stand among them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, now look at verse 37, whoever welcomes... One little child such as this in my name welcomes me. Now stop for just a moment. Who does this child represent? Does it represent little children? Does it represent any child, any physical child? Does it represent the weak, the poor? the marginalized, the, the, the society? Or does it represent believers? Is that child to represent believers? Well, notice the clue here in the passage and how you can know the answer that's, that's hidden right here in the story. Um, 
Taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever come, whoever welcomes one little child such as this in what? In my name. One that is welcomed in my name, in the name of Jesus, is a believer. The child represents believers. And what he is saying is that anybody that does not welcome a believer in Christ, whether that be an irrelevant from society standards, irrelevant, weaker, maybe poor, marginalized, one that's oppressed, as James says, one that comes into the congregation and maybe he doesn't look or she doesn't look like the rest of the congregation. James uses the illustration of they don't have golden rings. They don't have fancy clothing. They don't have the the kind of exterior that the church in James's um, day that would be used to, that they are to be welcomed into the fellowship because of their status in Christ, not because of their social status, because they belong to Jesus. And he is saying anyone that would not welcome somebody in my name then you are not welcoming me. You are no friend of my Father. You are no friend of me. The church didn't do a very good job at at teaching me about different groups of Baptists when I was a child. I thought all Baptists were the same. And so I had this opportunity for one semester um, to go to a Bible college, and it was called Free Will Baptist Bible College, where in that denomination they believe you can fall from grace, you can lose your salvation, but I didn't know the difference. Baptist, I want to go there. So I went to that school, and it was a requirement (laughs) For you to be in church somewhere on Sunday morning. So as a college student, um, didn't think to, to bring a coat and a tie and all those good things. So I show up at this church and I didn't think I was dressed all that badly. I didn't have a coat on. And there's an usher that meets me at the door. And instead of doing what an usher ought to do, shake your hand, welcome you, help you find a seat in the sanctuary. He looked at me and he said, son, you go home and when you can find something appropriate to wear to church, then you can come back and be part of this church. Man, my heart was broken. (laughs) I never experienced anything like that before. I was was absolutely crushed. You know, over the years I've, I've thought about that. I thought about lost people that maybe just thought it was the right thing to do to visit a church. Maybe somebody invited that lost person to church. And that usher told them, don't come back in these doors until you can dress what we consider to be appropriate. What if that person never ever darkens the door of a church again and says, you know what, if this this is God... I don't really want any parts of this mean-spirited group. And to hell, possibly that person goes. To hell, that person does go. They don't know Christ. And the opportunity they had to know Christ was stomped out by somebody, the wicked spirit. Jesus is saying, those that don't welcome, those that believe in me, in my name, And they're not welcoming me either. But notice how far he goes in this. Look at um, at verse 37. Whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. Then notice what he says. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who 
sent me. So, when you welcome those in Jesus' name, you are not just welcoming Jesus, but you are welcoming the one who sent Jesus. Jesus is saying, you are welcoming my Father. You are honoring my Father. You are bringing glory to the Father by welcoming people in my name. Who is the greatest? The greatest is the one that humbles himself as a servant and pours his life into pointing people to Jesus. I've asked you before, who's the most important member? Who's the most important person in this church? It's the person who humbles himself or herself before God and pours themselves out praying to God and asking God for the blessings of this church. If we want to be the greatest, we have to first be last. We have to first be servant. That The one who faithfully serves Christ in that heart and in that spirit, in the eyes of Jesus, is the greatest. Let's pray tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thankful for the day that you've allowed us to have. I'm thankful for every single person here tonight who was here this morning. I'm thankful for this church, Lord. And God, I pray that you would just continue to speak to us through your word. Help us, Lord, to understand the beauty of self-denial, the beauty of humility, the beauty of servanthood. And God, I pray tonight, Lord, that we would respond to this message according to your spirit. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Please stand.